Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our webinar today which is on the subject of uh, using micro drainage for SEDS technical submissions. Uh, my name is Peter Coombs and uh, welcome for any newcomers at all. Uh, this is the first for me because it's the first time I'm actually presenting a webinar under the brand, the new brand of Innovise. Uh, so for those that are not aware, uh, XP Solutions, uh, formerly Micro Drainage, has now merged with the Innovise group and we are all rebranding under the Innovise name. So all the products are the same, personnel, offices, etc., and very much business as usual, um, but the, the name has, has changed in terms of the company. Um, so looking at what we'll cover today, uh, what I wanted to do is just have a look at um, who's actually approving our SUDS designs in the first place, uh, and then move on to look at the most common standards and the guidance documents that are available that the people are using um, for their technical submissions. And then how we can go through a workflow process using micro drainage to gain that uh, all important SUDS technical approval, because uh, we, we hear a lot with the planning applications that there are two key areas that are delaying planning applications. One could be um, the initial drainage calculations that are going in. So everyone's now feeling as though you have to do more and more detailed design, even at the outline planning stage. Uh, and the other one is um, connecting your highway into an existing highway, a section 278 type agreement. So those two kind of things, um, the SUDS and the, um, the, the, the connection to an existing highway being the two uh, areas that are holding up a lot of approvals from the civil, civil engineering point of view. Uh, and then we'll take a look at upcoming events at the end of the, of the demonstration and the webinar. So who, who is approving our SEDS designs? Um, we, we had in April of 2015, the SAB role, the SEDS approving body role, um, applied to the local planning authority, which surprised uh, quite a few people at the time. Um, so the local planning authority are the people that we submit our calculations to, our drainage assessments, etc. cetera. Um, but the local planning authority the local planning officer won't have that kind of technical skill to be able to assess your application. So who do they refer to? Well, there are a range of statutory consultees within this process, uh, lead local flood authority being probably the key one, I would say, nowadays uh, in, in your local area. Um, so the local planning authority will submit your application, your submission to the lead local flood authority. So my first advice would be um, talk to the lead local flood authority as early in the process as you possibly can and um, talk to the flood risk manager because they've gained great insight into their local flooding issues. Um, if you're connecting into a main river uh, because the lead local flood authorities look after ordinary water courses, if you're connecting your your um, development into a main water course, a main river, then you would need to consult also with the environment agency. So you, you, you would um, ideally contact those at an early stage too. That's fairly rare, so it's typically the local, lead local flood authority. Um, and also there are certain areas of the country covered very well by internal drainage boards. So once, once more, I would um, contact the IDB, the Internal Drainage Board, at the very outset, if at all possible, if you, if you know who those people are. And then, of course, we have water companies, because we want to um, put in a submission that's then going to be approved, adopted, and maintained by somebody. So that's another question coming up a little bit later on. So you should be able to see that what we're finding now, uh, and, and the typical audience um, logged in today, I would say, would be mainly UK, um, but 56% of us are finding that the lead local flood authority is approving our, our SEDS design. But of course, the lead local flood authority um, is probably not going to adopt to maintain that subsystem. So we'll have another little poll later on and see who's doing that. 9% um, saying the water companies are doing that. And there are some forward-thinking water companies, Anglian Water, um, United States, Yorkshire Water, they're, they're forward-thinking uh, and looking at um, SUDS approvals themselves, which is great. 8% on the Environment Agency. That, that sort of stacks up for me because, uh, as I say, it's, it's fairly rare that we connect directly into a main river, but that would be uh, totally valid. And then 27% um, for the Local Planning Authority. And that's actually a higher figure than I was anticipating in my, in my mind. I was thinking it would be mainly the lead local flood authority. But thanks for that. That's, that's, that's great. And I hope you enjoyed participating. 
So in terms of the standards that we're using and the guidance documents, um, we have the National SED standard that came out in March of 2015. Um, this was deemed to be a little bit weak. Um, and so there was a, a subsequent document that came out on the heels of that, uh, produced by the local authority SEDS officers organization. Oh, sorry, I, I, need, I need to hide the, um, hide the poll now and then go back to my screen. Thank you, thank you, Max. Uh, I'm glad Max was there. He can tell me what you're all seeing, and I know it was locked out on the, uh, on the results. Thanks, Max. Um, yeah, so after the National said Standard came out and, and deemed to be quite weak uh, by those that need to, to use it as a guidance document, um, they, they produced their own guidance document, this LASU non-statutory technical guidance document for sustainable drainage systems. And I'll use this a little bit during the course of the demo today. Um, the steering group comprised of local authorities, but included also water companies um, like Anglin Water, United Utilities, the House Builders Association, as well as the Home Builders Federation. So there's a sort of cross-party cross document that was produced. It's a live document, so uh, there is a link to the website and that is constantly being updated. So um, do, do keep abreast of that. I like it because uh, it covers the, the planning process itself and it helps us to understand uh, why we're being asked for things at certain parts of the process, um, right the way through from pre-application all the way through to full application application reserve matters etc um, <clears throat> so within the document i'm going to use this to generate a sort of workflow with micro drainage looking at what we need to submit which is shown on the right hand side at what stage of the planning process so as we go across the columns you start off at pre-application stage leading to outline and then full application and then along the um, rows here because we go down through the rows you can see that we need to submit increasing amounts of detail as we go through that process. So what I plan to do is show you um, what you can do within microdrainage to comply with this at the various stages. I also love the document from the point of view that it puts a little bit more meat on the bone. And what we're looking at initially is identifying where the outfalls will be. Uh, where, where's the runoff across the surface of the terrain right now? Where, where's the runoff running across the across not just your site but around the catchment surrounding your site are you being influenced by extreme runoff events unfortunately we had a, a bad situation in cornwall this week with that really um flash flood that that, that that occurred we get these every summer it feels like when we get um pluvial flooding could be fluvial with the rivers but it also could be just extreme runoff um, being captured and run across the surface um, like the Thatcham event that happened in 2007, uh, which is frightening to think that was a decade ago. Um, but apart from identifying the runoff pre-development, we're, we're looking at the flood risk outside of the development. So what would the impact be of your development upon the existing catchment? And the, the people that are better informed on this would be the, the flood risk managers, as well as the environment agency and your IDB contacts. They know very well now where the risks are, are lying further maybe downstream of your site because you may wonder why you're being asked to go back to greenfield rates when the site is up the hill dry feet um, no flooding in sight it's all, all all the impact of these developments over time um, putting pressure on the downstream condition that we need to be mindful of and we're trying to, to gain betterment with our new developments we need to look at what the peak discharge rates will be. So we're going to control those. We're going to look at the, the volume of runoff coming from the development as well. And as I say, it's not just about the flood risk within the development, but we need to be mindful of that when the design has been exceeded. So we need to go way beyond our design at the end of the stage, at the end of the, end of the process, and then provide evidence that we have managed that surface water condition such that properties are not flooded, and the flooding is contained within our development and not just passed on to the neighbors downstream. There's also a lot of very good regional guidance. Um, the Southeast Seven SEDS Master Planning Document being one. Uh, I know of one in the, in the Bristol area, in the Southwest as well. So do look out and, and talk to those lead, lead, lead local flood authorities. The flood risk managers will help you with these guidance documents in your local areas. And there is also a lot of very good local 
uh, guidance as well, such as this from Leicester City Council. And there are a range of them. Um, there is a very good link on the SES Drain website. Um, so we could provide that for you to uh, enable you to go and take a look and see if there is any local guidance. Um, within this presentation, I've just hovered over that guidance document. You can see that there's a hyperlink to the PDF of this document as well. So we could potentially send this out if you'd like a copy of the slides. Um, just, just send in a message and uh, we'd happily share those with you with the hyperlinks to the various um, locations for these documents. And the, the sort of all-encompassing best practice guide for sustainable drainage systems being the latest SEDS manual, Syria C753. And the very important four pillar approach now of not just focusing on the quantity of the water, but being more mindful with regard to the quality of the water and ensuring that we build in amenity value and enhanced biodiversity, all absolutely as important as one another. And just to be aware, this is not out yet, um, but there's a, a work in progress right now on sewers for adoption 8th edition. So we're working off of the 7th edition right now. With the 8th edition, um, there may we well be a redefinition of the, uh, of the legal definition of a sewer to allow water companies themselves to adopt said systems. So as to get over that, that hurdle of the stumbling blocks. So let's have a look at the, at the next poll. And at the minute, uh, what, what are you finding, folks? If I launch this this one, <clears throat> um, what are you finding is being applied as a standard for you to comply with with your said submissions? This is a little bit closer than the than the previous um, poll. So what we can see is that 13% um, of us are being asked to comply with the national said standard. 2% um, only with the LASU non-statutory guidance document. And uh, that, that's interesting. Um, it takes the national standard, but adds more meat to the bone. So uh, if you do make yourself more aware of what's contained within the LASU non-statutory guidance, it may, it may well help you um, because the national set standard is quite um, high level, if you know what I mean, in terms of its principles, a little bit more detail in, in the non-statutory guidance. 8% um, looking at uh, regional guidance, 28% at local guidance, and isn't that interesting? Um, my background was local authority in the 1970s and the early 1980s, and we each had um, local technical standards. And we've re virtually gone full circle now um, through from um, sewers for adoption, which is all encompassing across the whole of the country, um, to now for our SED submissions, going back more so to local guidance or the all-encompassing national standard in effect, which is the SEDS manual. So yeah, 28% local guidance, 48% SEDS manual. Really interesting. I shall now um, hide that. So hopefully the screens will go back to my um, screen and then we can carry on. There we are. So in terms of the workflow, what, what am I gonna show you now? Well, we'll start off by looking at those uh, identification of the blue green corridors look at the outfalls look at where the runoff is going right now and then uh, we can take a look at the um, extent of the green field um, a little bit of a debate on happening on what we take into consideration in terms of greenfield runoff um, is it the gross area or is it the area of our development that will become impermeable so sort of question um, out, out there for everyone and um, We'll take a look at calculating greenfield discharge rates. So all the kind of preliminary work we need to do for the flood risk assessment. We need to do this kind of drainage strategy and uh, come out with some preliminary, preliminary outline hydraulic calculations. So all this kind of work that we need to do for pre-app and outline, I'm going to sort of run through uh, very swiftly. And then we can sketch out the locations of our SUD structures to then enable us to provide those uh, preliminary hydraulic calculations here. So I'll, I'll show what that's all about. And then once we've done that, uh, we need to check what our proposal will be compared to the greenfield condition, the pre-development condition. Uh, and that should get us over the, the necessary hurdles at the start. Then what we can do is we can design the whole flow conveyance system in micro drainage, we can then incorporate the SEDS systems, 
um, attenuation structures, infiltration structures, whatever they may be, into an integrated model. And then we can analyze it. And we can compare the greenfield condition with the new condition, the, the, the new development condition, uh, to make sure that we've not gone beyond the discharge rates, discharge volume, etc. And we will then finally go beyond the design and test our model to illustrate the overland flood flow paths to make sure that we don't flood property and we don't just dump the flooding into the neighbor's back gardens. So in terms of the live demo, that's the process I intend to run through. And if I just alt tab through here now, what we could do, um, I could start off, I'm saying micro drainage, but of course, what everyone's starting off with is actually a land survey. So what I could do within my um, grain modeling package, whatever that might, might be, increasing numbers of people using XP Site 3D, what, what you would do is you would bring in your um, land survey. So if I just open up my 3D survey, and with the land survey, we can switch that into a three-dimensional surface. And on the, on the survey itself, to identify the overland routing, this is what people may do with like ground modeling packages, they could kind of contour it. So we could, we could contour this surface, at say every 100 millimeters and, and show that. So there's my contoured surface. Now, it's fine um, and it's really useful, but it's not showing me the overland um, flow rates. And as I move my mouse over the, the plan view here, we, we can see at the bottom of the screen the, um, the coordinates. And when I go onto the model, we can see the levels. So this is around about 32 meters. The Z coordinates telling me at the mouse location, this is 32 meters above um, sea level. And if I, if I move around, uh, we can see we're at 38. And they were going up to 45 meters above sea level. So, so the higher ground is over on the left-hand side, and the lower ground appears to be on the right-hand side. Um, we can display this, the surface as um, sort of like a heat map, um, red being high, blue being low. So that helps us to orientate ourselves a little bit better with the topography. But it's not really showing me where the where the water is going to flow, where my outfalls are going to be. Um, is showing me that it's going to be somewhere over to the east of the site rather than to the to the west of the site unless the development well that's the next question where is the development located uh, within the context of this grain model i could bring in and import uh, a cad drawing which could be the the layout of the of the site itself and you may find that a little bit hard to see but the development is is shown in this location here. Now, the reason why I brought the CAD drawing in last of all is because what I'm desperate to do with everybody, and you're, you, you can all do this as civil engineers, I would love for the civil engineers to just take the land survey data and then bring that into micro drainage and then analyze the overland flood flow routes before this information gets into the hand of the architect. Because what's happening, I understand, is that all the architects will do is cram in as many properties as they, as they can into the confines of the site, hand over the layout to the civil engineers and say, there you go, guys, design the roads, design the drainage, make it work for me. And you're being restricted right at the very outset with overland flood routing. Um, and let's, let's just have a look at what I mean by that. So in terms of um, micro drainage, if I open up micro drainage, it's the same model. Um, I've imported the terrain model and I've I can import the CAD drawing as well. And I've got um, a heat map on here. I've just I've just put in different colors as well. So again, red, red is high, light blue is low. So we get a little bit more, um, sort of a little bit of detail uh, on that topography. Um, but what I'd like to do is without having the CAD drawing there at all, now run a deluge and see where the water is gonna flow across the terrain uh, before we hand this information back to the architect so that hopefully he can plan out the layout uh, of the new development in sympathy with the overland flood flow routes. routes. Because when it does flood eventually, um, bearing in mind our sites within this kind of zone in the, in the middle, you're going to get a lot of runoff from the higher land running down through the new development. 
So what are we going to do about that? Are you going to put in a cutoff drain here and divert that around the site? Or if the, if the layout is such, could we just run you know, a main stream through the middle of the site, create public open space, create amenity, improve biodiversity? You see what I'm, where I'm coming from with the SUDS manual. So what I'll do, let me just switch off the heat map. So I'm in uh, micro drainage and I'm using um, draw net to illustrate this plus flood flow, by the way, just, just to let you know what I'm, what I'm working with. You'll, you'll see all the modules in the bottom left hand corner of the screen here, but it's essentially the draw net and the flood flow that I'm using to, to illustrate this right now. And at the bottom here, when you have flood flow, you can click on flood flow analysis. And this will enable us to split the ground model into grid squares. I'm going to choose four meter by four meter. Um, let's say that it's, this is rural at the minute. Um, so the surface of each of those grid squares will be um, a, a Manning's end roughness equivalent to grass. Uh, and then I'm going to put in the starting depth of water and we can put in 50 mil, 100 mil, whatever, and see where that water will run over a one hour period. So this will take about a minute or so to um, to just run. And at the end of this, we can extract the information in a CAD format and then pass this back to the architect to say, here you go. Um, this is where the, the deeper sections of water are, are wanting to flow across the site. Can you sympathetically lay out the development with public open space that will enable us to, to do this? And there we are. So now we can see that we have blue, red, uh, yellow, and white. If I right click and show you the display settings, just to provide you with a, a sort of key um, in terms of what we're looking at, uh, we're looking at the flood flow colors here. And it's really this bottom spreadsheet. So I'm, I've said here, don't show me any water that's shallower than 75 millimeters at all. This is all the black area. There may be water on there, but it's shallower than 75 mil. From 75 millimeters up to 150 millimeters, show it to me in blue. And then when you get to um, deeper than 150 up to 300, show me in red. And then when you go deeper than that, show me yellow. So the deeper, the deeper water is yellow and white. And you can see that what's happening, you've also got a, a direction arrow and that's the top spreadsheet here. If I zoom in a little bit, if I just ban zoom in, zoom in there. Um, against each grid square, we can see there's a direction arrow. That's telling me the velocity, the maximum velocity that the water has flowed across the square and a vector showing me the, the general direction of that flow of water across the square in the one hour period. So this is the information that I'd love for people to then just save out. You can either save out the image as a bitmap or whatever, or you could save it out as a DXF, DWG file format and, and give that back to the architect. Now there's something a little bit quirky going on here um, because I, you, you'd kind of expect there to be water running off from the large uh, higher area here and then just kind of sweeping across here, but maybe in, in rivulets. But you can see here, we've got like areas of ponding and what have you. Now the reason for that if I, if I show you what I've done with the triangulation, I have actually brought in the triangulated model with the layout that the architect produced with the highway detailed up with a balanced cut and fill. So this is immediately showing me what the implications are going to be. And we're going to have ponding areas uh, within this development. So if I show you the CAD drawing, Okay, and they're looking a little bit busy, but if I turn off the triangulation, you can see what I've, what I've done. So had we provided this information without the ground model with the highway in here, you'd probably see there'd be a rivulet going through the middle of the site. If, if the architect could have rotated this by, you know, 45 degrees or whatever, uh, maybe we could have run public open space through the middle. I don't know. One to discuss, but uh, one of my pet pet peeves. Now, if you don't have um, Drawnet in Floodflow, there is another alternative for you, and that's to use um, the um, MD Suds module. It's it's a bolt-on module, um, and this is a module that we've produced that a lot of people are using for a lot of the preliminary work. Um, so again, it's the same terrain model, 
Uh, this is showing you the plan view with the contours, and we can set up contours on here as well as you can in the other software programs. Um, but we can also del deluge. So if I turn off the um, color fill, if I turn off the contours, the, the screen's gone blank, but the, the detail information is um, under, underneath. And then we can right click, and then we can deluge this, you know, four meter by four meter grid squares, 50 mil of water over a 60 minute period, etc. And it just shows you the same, the same kind of deluge that would have occurred as I showed you with the flood flow earlier on. It takes a minute to run, gives me a chance to have a quick uh, sip of the tea. Uh, I've got Max here, by the way. So if you do have any questions, and yeah. if there's anything that Max would like to say, then uh... yeah, I'm just going to set up the questions. If next time we run an analysis, we'll uh, I'll ah. set the questions up. For some reason, it's not quite displaying at the minute. Okay. Um, okay. If you want to post questions, then then feel free to do so, and we'll try and attempt to answer them as we go through, or as I say, we can answer them at the end of the day. So here we go. It's the same deluge. You can see the ponding within our development. If I just um, add on the CAD drawing for you, that will make life uh, a little bit clearer. And we can also bookmark within um, within um, MD sets. You have this opportunity to be able to zoom in. So I've got the model extents bookmarked. I can now take a look at the site extents and go to that view. So I've kind of zoomed in. And we can see that we've got um, we've got our ponding in the corners here. Uh, the red is the deeper, and the blue is the shallower water. And if we take a look at a, another bookmark and just zoom into the northeast corner, go, go to that. And you have the arrows, the direction arrows, as as you saw in in the flood flow with drawnet in micro drainage itself. So we can do the same kind of preliminary work here. Um, what else will we now do at this particular stage? Well, for the site itself, in MD says what I've done, I've set up a couple of phases. And we can see that we've got a pre-development situation and a post-development situation. So what have I done with the pre-development? If I go to the bookmark and just show you the extent of the sites of the site. And if I switch off all these direction arrows, you've got the gist on where the water is going to flow. So obviously the outfall is going to be somewhere over here in the right hand side of the screen. Um, what I've done here, I'm looking at the pre-development. I've defined the area of the site. So if I click on the inflow, how have I done that? Um, on the right hand side of the screen, I've just chosen an area. I've dragged and dropped onto the development and I've defined the extent, the curtilage of my site. And that site is, if I double click on there, within the polygon, just over three hectares um, gross area. So that gives me some meaningful data straight away. What, what can I do with that information? Well, we can now go to um, take a look at our site and uh, right, so if I go to my design tools. And what we can do is we can take a look at the Greenfield runoff characteristics. So one of the first things we need to do is identify what the Greenfield runoff rates are from the site. So we can input our 3.005 hectares if we're allowed to take consideration of the gross area of the site. Now, very interesting because the feedback from the poll was suggesting that you have like local guidance. So now I'm expecting there to be, you know, if, if there are um, we've got 153 lead local flood authorities. I don't think we're going to have 153 different requests, but I think that there may be split. You may find that there are some local authorities with a low risk of flooding in their particular um, boroughs, and they may well allow you the greenfield area, the, the gross area. There could be a lot of others, the municipality um, type locations in the inner cities with a lot of existing flooding and they may well say no we're not going to allow you uh, the discharge rate from the gross area it needs to be based upon what will be the impervious area post development so that's that's going to be something like 60 percent of that footprint will become paved with roads roofs footpaths drives etc so you may have to scale this down to you know 1.8 hectares um, you, you, you can choose on the map button where the site is. So we can look at wherever your, your site location is. And then you hit calculate. 
and we're in region six so it's actually this stream this 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 row here would be our target greenfield discharge rates post development based on that gross area so there we are we've got our greenfield discharge rates identified um, straight away um, what we've done we can do this in in md sets we can also do this in source control so if i click on the rural runoff calculator it's exactly the same way of working now what we do have is a brand new method that's starting to come through so um, i haven't got a poll on this by the way but it would be interesting to hear from you uh, just 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 post a note in the message to say are you being um, if you are being asked to submit your greenfield calculations based on ref h2 methodology now we've added that into the source control because everyone has got source control but not necessarily everyone has got empty suds right now so we focused on the most common one um, now I don't have ref h2 installed on my machine I need to have that installed but basically when I do have it installed on my laptop or PC then you can go and uh, obtain that data online that'll then populate my catchment descriptors and I can then calculate the greenfield discharge rates rural and urbanized runoff rates using source control so we've put that into source control for you already. Just make sure you're up to date with your latest version, 2017. I'm running 2017.1.2, by the way, just to let everyone um, know what the latest version is. So great, we've calculated the greenfield discharge rates. Uh, what else would we want to do at this stage? Well, we, we'd need to know what kind of volume of storage we're looking for, and then we're going to distribute that storage around the site somehow or another so we need to mitigate against flooding typically the 30-year return period so what would be the volume of storage required to mitigate against flooding for the 30-year return period well we can run a quick storage estimate so i'm back in md suds and what we can do is we can either use the plan data that 3.05 hectares well that's the gross area of the, the of the curtilage of the site so i want to know and factor that down to say 1.8 hectares because that's the um, area that will become impervious um, bear in mind we're doing some preliminary calculations now I could say that 100% of that area will be uh, running off and uh, di discharging at what rate well I'd need to use my discharge rate based on the quick storage estimate in the first place so I might say I've got a, a Q bar figure of 13 liters per second that I'm targeting. I'm in a clay soil, so there's no infiltration. And then you, you select your rainfall. And I might want to choose um, the six hour, 100 year event, uh, but I, I might also want to choose all the 30 year return period events. Um, I, I would do that. I'd, I'd choose the 30 year return period, hit calculate, and it'll come back with a, a volume for me. That I can then distribute around the site and that's what, I, what I've done um, if I cancel on that and just cancel on that and say no to that um, that's what I've done with my kind of post development um, scenario so what I've done here I've taken the volume and again that volume can be calculated in source control by the way so you all have source control um, and then I've identified the, the, the drainage systems that were likely to distribute around the site so these can be swales they can be porous car parking areas and they can be ponds those kind of elements i'm thinking of the the more natural um, elements that are going to provide the biodiversity and the amenity value which in my mind i would love to have had like running through the middle of the site uh, rather than being distributed around because they're now kind of acting as sort of cutoff drains and, 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 and taking the runoff around into a, a pond and then discharging off site. Um, all, all, all you need to do to add these structures onto the model here is to drag and drop them from the right hand side, by the way. So you can drag and drop and then define the extent of your swale. And this is this is why I'm sort of sharing with you the MD sets, because one of the things we have to do is to show the extent of these not just to the clients to show that we're not taking up too much land but also also to submit to the lead local flood authorities and if i double click on the this particular swale um, you can see that we we have an exceedance level 
So around the perimeter of the swale, what the program's done is read off of the terrain model and found out that the low spot around the perimeter on the terrain is 34.43 meters above datum. That's the point at which water would um, exceed and flood onto the terrain surface. So now I can set a free board level beneath that um, to give me a warning against flood risk. And I can set the invert level of the swale. And the swale is going to look like this. It's just effectively a ditch. It's in clay, so there's no infiltration through the base or the sides. I've got a, a longitudinal slope. Um, I've got a side slope and then an invert level or base level and then an exceedance level and set 100 millimeters below that is my um, freeboard level. So if the water is within 100 mil of the surface, it'll say flood risk. If it floods above the surface, it's flood. Um, below, it's just okay. So it's really useful because we can add in those side slopes. Um, a lot of people are using, the majority of people are using the SEDS manual. <coughs> Excuse me. And within the SEDS manual, we're being asked uh, with our swales for more advanced um, inputs. And that advanced input would be um, putting in a delay time. We want to retain the water within the swale for at least nine minutes, which is 540 seconds. And that's what we can do here. We can hold that water back for nine minutes. We can have um, evapotranspiration being considered. So the rate of evapotranspiration back into the atmosphere, add in interception volumes, and we can build in infiltration rates if the soil conditions are, uh, are allowing us to. So by scoping that out, at this stage, we can put our structures in place. We can connect those structures together. So I've got a series of connections, if I just click on there. So the runoff from this area now is running off into my swale. Um, how is it running off into the swale? Well, there's like an inlet condition. So if I click on that, and then if I zoom, zoom into my uh, northeast corner of the site, I don't have to use the bookmark, I can just like band zoom in there. So I'm taking the runoff from this area of the site and that's coming in, not as point inflow at the top end of the swale, but as lateral inflow along the side of the swale. So that's, that's being taken into consideration. And then we have outlets going from the swale. If I just zoom back up a little bit. So I'm limiting the discharge, I'm putting in putting in some cascading swales here with a weir just to hold back the flow to cascade through into the next swale, which then cascades down into the pond itself. So that's how I've made everything uh, work. And I've then analyzed the model. And uh, when, when, when you analyze, there's a really nice little validate button, by the way, when you create the model, it'll tell you if you've got any kind of crazy levels or something like that. But I validated the model and then I picked green for go to analyze based on the 100 year six hour event so that I can get some results back, which is going to tell me if I just click on update preview, what the discharge rate is post development compared to the discharge rate pre development. So I need to just go back and check that this is hitting my you know, Q bar figure or whatever that may be. Um, and what the volume of discharge is post-development compared to pre-development. So this would be the kind of output that we can then send on to the lead local flood authority to say, yeah, here's my plan. We're going to put in these structures. Here's my schematic of where they're going to, to be. They're all interconnected through these flow paths. And this is what the discharge rate will be post-development. And this is what the volume will be post-development compared to pre-development, et cetera. So that should hopefully get you a tick in the box at the early stage of the process. But then what do we do? Well, we would want to incorporate into a fully integrated model. Um, we're moving now onto the sort of more detailed design side of things. So we need to design the flow conveyance system within micro drainage. And what I would do there is typically uh, with XP Site 3D, I've got 35 days left before I need to extend my license on XP Site 3D. Um, so within XP Site 3D, I would uh, design the highway system, uh, and then within that, I would define the drainage network, stormwater and foul water. And here you can see in the 3D view, we've got the stormwater system on the right-hand side. All of that information that we've got in 
XP Site 3D, I can then export. So if I um, save that out, and I can take out that information in a microdrainage MDX format, design, literally design the pipe network within microdrainage, and then I can import the results back um, from the drainage in an MDX format again. Oops, if I just go import drainage and then MDX file format. So we can we can exchange the MDX format in, in and out of XP Site 3D. Um, to do the design, uh, I'll be using micro drainage. So here's my drainage network. I've got the pipes showing up in, in red. And I need to create this integrated model. So what I need to do now is introduce these swales that I've maybe designed in uh, MD sets. You can design you can design swales in, in um, source control as well. But if we design the swale in source control, when it comes to integrating into the model, um, what we'd have to do is bring the swale in as a structure. And if I just sort of drag and drop the swale from source control, I would have to drag and drop that onto the downstream end of the swale for the program to understand the impact of the swale. If I try and drag and drop it onto where the actual swale is, you can see it's, it's not done anything. I've got to drag it onto a node, onto a manhole. Now with MD SEDS, um, because we're analyzing the flow of the water through the structure, we have something called FT structures, flow through structures, which you can work with if you're working with the MD SEDS module in the background. So if I drag and drop my flow through structure, if I drag and drop the swale now from flow through structures, I can now add, I can really replace the link. So, oops, just hitting the screen here. Um, all I need to do is import, import that from, if I just go to my D drive and training. Okay, I've got a, a file here which contains MDS, uh, MD sets files, MDSX files. So if I go to a, a completed model and here's my swale that I've designed with MD sets that you saw earlier on. And now all I need to do is specify the Manning's end roughness, which is grass, so 0 0.035, and then say OK. And on the plan view, you'll notice that the line has changed from a, a single red line to a double line with an arrow. So that's now a flow through structure. If I wanted to drag and drop my pond, I can drag and drop the pond across, not onto the node, but onto the link and replace that sort of pipe or whatever that it is there with the with the pond and then same story import I just need to trace my steps again so I go to draining and my MD sets folder and then choose an MDSX file and my completed model contains the pond that I designed and what I, I can adjust the invert level the cover levels and things like that I need to put in even a mining zen for the for the pond and now, on the plan view, you'll see that we've replaced the link with the pipe. So that's great. Um, what I'll do now is within my micro drainage, look at the completed model. So here's my absolutely completed model. You see, I've, I've got a more comprehensive model here now. Um, so I've got something flowing as a cutoff drain, maybe feeding into the swales, coming down, feeding into the pond. And what I've done here, I've run the discharge wizard because having completed my model, I now need to check the um, post-development discharge rates and volume against the pre-development discharge rates and volume. And how do I do that? I run the discharge wizard. So I'm now using the APT module within microdrainage and the discharge wizard will take us through step by step. So this would be the main one that the lead local flood authorities will be interested in seeing the results for. So I'm going to run both the summer and winter profile events, all the storm durations, 50 minutes to seven days. We can check a range of return periods, one year, 30 year, 100 year, plus 40% for climate change. And then we can put in our 
pre-development greenfield discharge rates that we calculated in the first place. So I've got here for the one year return period, 11.3 liters per second. But because I'm in clay, there's no infiltration. I know the volume is going to be higher post-development because I'm in clay. So I know that I'm going to be restricted to the Q bar figure of 13.3 for anything really above the um, two year return period. So that includes the 30 year and the 100 year with the climate change. And then I hit finish and it runs the analysis for me. And the results that, uh, that we have look like this. We've got some passes in green and some failures in red and something that I didn't run at all, which is the first five millimeters of, of rainfall. So let's take a look at the discharge rates. Um, remember that we put in there um, 11.3 and 13.3. Well, we're, we're, we're good. We've got the greenfield uh, discharge rates uh, nailed with the post-development rates. So happy days with that. That should be um, make, making the flood risk manager happy. Um, the volume post-development, when you've completely integrated the model, you can see that the volume that's being discharged for that 100-year, six-hour event is actually higher than the pre-development runoff volume. And that's not a, that's not a surprise. Um, that's because we've added in impervious areas onto a clay soil. So you're pretty well guaranteed to get more volume post-development than you are pre-development. And that's why I believe we're going to be restricted back to that Q bar figure, which we've satisfied. So you can print out the res results and you should get an approval coming through in short order from that. But that's not the end of the story. The other thing that we need to do is we need to take a look at what will happen actually post-development. So we need to go way beyond the uh, design in terms of no flood. So we're looking at the worst case or worst cases for the 100 year um, event with 40% for climate change. And that's what I've set up in the simulation criteria. So with this particular model, <clears throat> I've got two different storm durations that happen to be critical. It's either the 360 minute. I feel like I've been obsessed with the 360 minute today, but uh, it's just the way it is with the model. So it's a 360 minute winter profile event that's critical. I've added in the climate change in here um, uh, within the simulation criteria, because then when I run the analysis with flood flow, so this is the dynamic analysis with flood flow. Um, what I've gone down to is a one meter by one meter grid square. This took probably about an hour to run before the webinar. Um, I'll just let it run in the background, but this took about an hour to run this one analysis, just to give you an idea. If I run it four meter by four meter, it takes it takes about three or four minutes. Um, but with the increased number of grid squares, um, it does take a lot longer to run, just to be aware. And when the flooding comes out of the drainage system onto the terrain, it will be allowed to flow back into the underground drainage system because I've used dynamic analysis. If I use static analysis, it effectively will seal off the manhole covers and not allow the water to flood back in. It'll allow flooding out, but it will not allow the flooding back into the underground network. And this um, diagram below, this plan view, is actually showing us what's going to happen when we go beyond the design. Where's the flooding going to go? If I hit the video play, and I'll speed it up a little bit because it is a a six hour event and then when the flooding starts I can slow it down a little bit. So now you can see that there's flooding occurring towards the eastern side of the site. We don't have flooding within the development itself and the flooding is flowing away from the properties but is that within the confines of the site? This is what we'd have to ensure uh, with our submission. So this is the evidence that we can provide. At the end of the run, this kind of freezes. So you can see the worst case scenario over that six hour period. And we can save this information out either as a CAD drawing. Um, so you can save it out as DXF or DWG. Um, or you could just save it out as an image. And those images being like bitmaps or JPEGs and things like that. So you can put those into the re reports uh, accordingly. And that should be enough evidence to enable you to get approval for your designs at the detailed stage.
So I hope you enjoyed that uh, demo, folks. Um, here's a summary of the workflow. Um, what I started off with is identifying those blue-green corridors. And what I'm trying to build in here is that amenity value, the biodiversity value, POS, public open space. So I'm trying to identify not just the drainage outfalls, but where we can realistically put in public open space, probably at the least cost, because if you have depressions in the ground, uh, lower lying areas, then as part of the landscaping, you're going to gain benefit in terms of the drainage aspects as well. Um, what did I use to do this? Well, you can either use Drawnet and FloodFlow uh, within the full micro drainage um, bundles, or if you don't have Drawnet and FloodFlow, you can always think of um, adding the MD Suds um, module onto it um, for, for 2995. But you know, talk to the, um, the account managers and they can send you a, a, a quote. But um, you could always add in the MD Suds module. It's got a lot more capability than just that deluging at the beginning. Um, it's going to help you with your drainage strategies and sketching out those SUDS layouts that are being asked for within that um, lasso guidance. <clears throat> we can also calculate greenfield discharge rates, and that's either source control or, or MD SUDS. The storage estimate for the volume under the ground, again, source control. We built that into MD SUDS as well. And those preliminary outline hydraulic calculations. Um, we could design the structures in source control. Um, it's not in a graphical way. Um, you can't show the extents, as it were, but we could design them and, and cascade them together and provide those outline hydraulic calculations. Um, but you can also um, add in that graphical input and, and show where these are uh, being placed um, with the CAD drawing with MD sets. Then we design the flow conveyance system, and that's using system one, um, or if you wanted to uh, incorporate a graphical method of designing the drainage network, then, then the DrawNet module. Um, if you don't have the DrawNet module, you could use XP Site 3D to define it and then import uh, into system one to do the design, that's another option. Uh, and then I completed an integrated model by dragging and dropping the structures into the completely integrated model, including all those SEDS elements. And that's with um, simulation uh, using source control, but they need to be added at, at nodes, at manholes, um, or uh, with MD SEDS, which is the flow through structure option, where we can replace the link with the actual structure itself. And then I analyze the, the pre and post development condition. Now, this is straightforward um, using APT. Uh, and the discharge wizard within micro drainage. And then I went way beyond the, um, the flood risk um, and flood mitigation uh, with, with the flood flow analysis using the worst case scenario with the greatest amount of flooding. I could have run the 15 minute as well as the 360 minute as well. Um, so that's the whole workflow process. And here are the elements of the micro drainage program that I utilized during the event. So just looking ahead as time's ticking by, uh, we've got a, uh, a, a bit of an exciting uh, webinar for us. Uh, there's an Innovise webinar next Tuesday to bring you up to date with where we are as Innovise the company. So it's not to do with the software, but it's the actual company itself. So we'll send out a separate invitation and link to that. Hope you can uh, join us uh, on Tuesday of next week. I believe that'll be Tuesday lunchtime next week. We're kind of entering into a holiday season. So we'd love to thank each and every one of you for attending the regional workshops. Max was uh, at many of them, as, as myself and Ruth and Lude Miller and Nick and Duncan, uh, yeah, Duncan, yeah and Mike, yeah, or the, the, the whole team. So thanks for coming to the regional workshops, folks. We really appreciated the feedback. We've had nothing but great feedback. Uh, we will be planning some for the autumn, um, but it's now getting into holiday season. So I know a lot of you guys are going to be away on holiday, enjoy. Um, and then we'll be away ourselves and then starting probably sort of October, November time. Uh, <clears throat> so again, if you want uh, us to run any particular topics within the workshops, do feel free to, to, to let us know. Um, the next webinar date, that's still yet to be decided. So we'll, we'll send out a, like a newsletter or an e-cast um, to invite you along to the next webinar when, that, when that's going to be apart from next Tuesdays. Uh, to do with the softwares. And then uh, through to training that's happening, we have uh, a day of XP Site 3D training. Um, fantastic uh, uptake of XP Site 3D road design package. 
there's a training day happening here in Newbury on the 5th of September. I'm not quite sure of the day of the week for that one at the top of my head, but um, more than welcome to come along and look forward to meeting you when you, you come into the Newbury office. That being said, I'll be on holiday myself. So uh, enjoy meeting Max. I think yeah, be the... myself and Mike, I think, yeah. running that one. It's a Tuesday. As well. Oh, there you go. Thanks, Max. So Tuesday and Max and Mike will be running the course. So say hi to Max and Mike when you come in. Um, and then we have uh, micro drainage training courses, A, B, F, G, and H. Now, what do these all mean? Course A, design fundamentals, how to design um, a stormwater and firewater network with system one. Course B, we're using source control and simulation to um, create those um, storage structures, attenuation structures. Um, course F, we're using simulation and source control to create infiltration structures and integrate them into the model. Uh, course G, we're looking at greenfield discharge rates um, and also runoff from rural areas. So remember that red um, hilly area, if you have to uh, generate the flow off of that higher land, you'd need to generate a unit hydrograph to take the flow into our drainage network or into a ditch or whatever. That's covered in training course G, if you have any of those kind of projects coming up. And if you need to do auditing and checking what you've done, um, where I was doing the analysis with the discharge wizard, for example, um, that's training course H, the checking and auditing course. So I believe there are spaces available on, on each of these right now. Um, go to the website and uh, you'll see if you if you can't book, then the course is full and we, we post that up as being full. Uh, and then if, if, if it's available, then look forward to seeing you. That's just about when I get back from, from my holidays myself. So I may just catch some of you at the end of that week. And then in October, we have XP Storm and XP Swim training as well. This is our modeling software when we're looking at um, modeling uh, known flooding issues uh, in local areas. So a lot of the uh, lead local flood authorities are working with XP Swim and XP Storm and modeling existing known flooding uh, issues. So that's, that's a great three-day course there as well. We just about run out of time. I'd just like to thank you all for your attendance and for your participation. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for Max's help as well. We'll answer your questions um, post-event and hope you found that useful and look forward to seeing you again in the very near future. Have a great day. Take care.